Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming David Senecal, product architect from Akami. Also, how was that keynote? Was that great or what? Is everyone happy to be here this morning on Friday? Awesome. So once again, uh, welcome me and joining uh, David Senecal, product architect with Akamai. He brings to us over 15 years of experience in computer security. Uh, so thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. So if you are responsible in your company for the good operation of your website, then chances are you came across bots. And today I want to talk to you about uh, how to detect them, at least what I've learned over the years, and how to manage them, because just detecting them is half of the battle. Uh, in order to you know, deal with them, uh, you, you need to make sure you provide the most appropriate response. So my name is David Senecal. I'm a product architect with Akamai Technologies. Before being a product architect, I was actually um, in a lot of support roles. So I started uh, with Akamai about nine years ago. Uh, as a technical support engineer, and that's where I start to encounter bots. Uh, and usually that was in a, in a bad situation where a customer would call us and would say, well, my, my, my website is slowing down and I need to understand why. And, and more often than not, what we would discover is that a bot was sending a lot of requests, uh, or very expensive requests, and slowing down the overall website and obviously then impacting uh, the, the good operation and impacting revenue potentially. Uh, then I move on, moved on as a professional services role as an enterprise architect. So in that case, I was no longer uh, firefighting like I, I used to do in a technical support engineer, but more helping customer integrate uh, the, our security solution and be more proactive about detecting bots and dealing, dealing with them you know, using our security portfolio. And then eventually, a couple of years ago, I decided to join our engineering team and kind of put all my knowledge around bots and what I've learned over the years around bots uh, into good use. And, um, and now I'm working in designing a product to, um, to, to do better bot management. A few words about uh, my company, Akamai. So we make the internet fast, reliable, and secure. So a lot of web acceleration uh, techniques, but also uh, security. Uh, we, on any given day, we see about uh, 15 to 30 percent of the world internet, uh, the world web uh, traffic going through, uh, through our servers. So chances are, on any given day, you know, any site that you're going, or most sites that you're going, uh, you're probably using our service without knowing it. And uh, we've been into the security business for about five years, officially, uh, but in practice, we've actually done security at Akamai for much longer than that. For example, we've had a WAF uh, offering for about seven years now. So today, what I want to talk about is obviously what are bots, uh, because bots come in all shape, on f shape or form, and uh, it's important to, um, to try to define what they are and what they are not. Uh, and uh, once you know what they are, who they are, and their purpose, and the different type of bots, then try to understand how to detect them. And um, once you detect them, try to identify them and to understand who they are, their purpose, what they're after, and potentially whether it's that activity is good for, for your website, good for your business, or it's potentially bad for your business. Um, but now, once you have a better visibility on all your bot activity and uh, you, know, you understand who's doing what, then that's when you can actually evaluate whether you have a bot problem or not. And, something really going to depend from one side to another. Uh, and once you know what, if you have a bad problem or not, then you need to figure out how you're going to deal with it. Because you know, the classic answer is to just deny that activity. But <clears throat> the problem when you do that, you give a direct signal to your, to your opponent that <clears throat> you've detected, you're detecting them, and you know, as soon as you start denying that activity, they will, they will morph and they will come back um, you know, to a different way and they will become vi invisible again. <clears throat> so first of all, I wanted to try to define what a bot is and um, I could have come up with my own uh, definition but I thought it would be easier to just see what kind of definition exists out there and the uh, first thing that I popped up when I did a search on that was uh, <clears throat> something on Wikipedia. So a bot is a machine capable of carrying out a complex series of action automatically, especially one programmable by a computer. So yeah, pretty much. 
that was kind of expected. Um, but in the context of web, uh, web traffic, uh, exactly what do they do? So, you know, uh, you have two main types of bots. You've got the known bots, so what I'm always going to refer and during this talk as a known bot, and the unknown bots. So the known bots usually are the ones who identify themselves in some kind of way, uh, in the, either in the user agent header or in, you know, in the header signature of all. <clears throat> so what do they do with this kind of bot? Usually, uh, they are beneficial. Those kind of bots are benefic beneficial to your website, to your operation. And what they're going to do is index um, your your website so that, for example, web search engines. That's what they do. They index your website so that when somebody uses their search engine and search for specific, uh, you know, specific uh, type of information, then if you offer this type of informational service, then they will. Uh, reference your, your website and it's going to bring you more customer to your website. Uh, but also what they do is collect product information in, you know, uh, including pricing or this kind of thing. Uh, for example, you've got um, web search, um, sorry, commerce search engine who do like kind of aggregate pricing or, or compare price between different vendors. Uh, and obviously in that case, they, they collect all this pricing information, this product information so that they provide an engine to the end user to to kind of quickly compare what's the cheapest offering out there or what's the best offering out there. Uh, also, you have some websites, some, some set web bots that are specialized in just monitoring the availability of your website. So most of you may be familiar with Keynote or Gomez who offers such service. So what about unknown bots? So the ones who don't clearly identify themselves in the, in the header signature, uh, the one who try to stay under the radar, who pretend to be somebody else, who pretend to be a, a regular browser. So what do they do? Well, pretty much the same thing as existing, uh, you know, as legitimate or known bots. Uh, they would do indexing, they would collect product information, they could, they could collect pricing information. Uh, and, but the problem is it's completely different purpose. They could uh, use that information as uh, competitive intelligence uh, to you know, potentially, uh, you know, direct uh, activity traffic or, or direct users to, uh, to, to their own website instead of your website, so that you don't really know how the information is being used. Uh, fraud as well is one big deal. Obviously, lots of bots are used to, to commit fraud. Um, so one example that we see a lot lately is uh, folks out there, you know, retrieve a list of uh, user credential and what they're going to do is replace those user credential uh, on multiple public websites out there um, and so it's a problem commonly known as the account takeover and, and obviously that's, that's if they manage to crack, um, to find a, 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 an account on any given website then they can use that to do various things like uh, you know use the, whatever credits they have or, or gift card or whatnot. So that, that's a big problem, obviously. Um, and also some other bots deal with, you know, trying to look for, find for some vulnerabilities so that they can just then do other kind of attacks uh, moving forward. So key bot problems as well. So obviously bots, are, and, and here I'm gonna talk about just good, you know, known bots and bad bots. They, they can actually, whether they are known or not unknown, good or bad, they, they can actually cause problem occasionally because it's, it can sometimes be overly aggressive. Uh, so what happens sometimes that activity will, you know, will, will actually sometimes overload your, your web servers and uh, which cause a bit obviously availability issue, meaning real users won't be able to access your website. Um, you know, the user exper experience in that case is not great and, uh, and the potentially loss of revenue. But also all these bad activities that you have to de deal with on a, a daily basis has a cost because potentially you have to provision server uh, to make sure you can handle that load and also has a cost in terms of bandwidth. Uh, plus, you don't really know how the information collected is being used. In the case of non bot obviously, it's a bit more obvious. But in the case of unknown bots, then it's kind of up to everybody's interpretation. So just also uh, to, to clarify the different type of bots. So it kind of goes, it's not all black and white. It's like black and white and many shades of grays in between. And um, you know, sometimes it's, the intent of the, the bot is obvious, but sometimes it's not so obvious. So on the good uh, side of the spectrum, you've got like the search engine bot, the SEO audience analytics bots, 
uh, online advertising, social media. So all of these kind of bots, um, you know, behind have companies that offer services that potentially will will help drive uh, users to your website and potentially if they drive users to your website that can increase your revenue so it's all good. Uh, now you've got you know going slightly further into the, the bad spectrum so you've got a vulnerability scanning. A vulnerability scan is fine if you're if you're the one running the vulnerability scan but if that's somebody else running it against you then obviously it's a different story you are you know you need to be more, more worried about that. Then some of you may have uh, partners who are running bots against your website just you know, because of some kind of business logic that you've agreed with them, you know, sharing on information and this kind of thing, and the best thing for, the best way for them to do, to get the information they need for their business, um, uh, for their business to, to help you in your business is to, uh, to scrape your website. Uh, but or sometimes you may have your own scrapers that, you're, that you have, your own bots that you're running, either to, um, you know, to check that your website is available or, or this kind of thing. So, uh, again, uh, the intent here is important and clearly identifying who's behind that bot activity is important. Uh, and then moving further, you've got guy aggregators. So again, if it's like a, a you know, data aggregator out there that sends, pub makes the data publicly available for the purpose of consumer to actually be able to quickly compare services from one site to another and potentially that site also uh, leading customers, go, you know, pointing that customer to your site then it's great, but if it's them collecting information from your website and just republishing as is without giving you the credit for it, then obviously it's bad because it's, you know, it can affect, your, can affect you uh, in some kind of way. Uh, then you've got spam bot, you know, doing spam. You've got scrapers that you don't know what's the purpose of it. Uh, you know, they're scraping your site. You don't know how the data is used. Usually they don't authenticate, identify themselves either. Uh, bots are coming fraud and then all the way to, uh, to DOS. Um, so this obviously is a big deal. Now, um, so not all bots are equal. Uh, not all bots are built the same. Uh, they are very, you know, some way pretty unique. Uh, you know, you can go from the simplest bots where pretty much you can create a bot with a curl request. You use a curl command, you can just, you know, you can create a bot that way. So it could be a curl script running on a single machine and because you have a lot of data to, uh, to, to scrape to, um, on, on the websites that you're targeting, then obviously you need to do a lot of requests, so your request rate will, will be pretty high. But now, if you want to stay under the radar, potentially you want to start distributing uh, your, your bot, your script, into multiple machines. So now you've got the concept of a botnet. So it's pretty much still a very simple script, uh, but distributed out on, on you know, the, the workload is shared between multiple machines. Um, but now, so if you want to stay under the radar, because one of, one of classic defense against high request rate is to put rate control on the website, uh, at least on the you know the front end to, to protect the website. So now, if you want to stay under the radar, uh, then you are going, you're going to expand further your botnet, uh, add more um, you know more, more nodes into your botnet, so that you can still collect the same amount of information, but lower your request rate to stay under the radar. Uh, and then if you want to be a bit more clever, you, you will try to randomize uh, your, your request pattern so that you know, it's not predictable, for example, instead of, um, instead of sending one request or 10 requests per second, send only one request every, every second, or you kind of randomize it like you, know, you send a request only every 10 seconds or, or you know, a viable delay between each request. Uh, going a bit further, a bit in, in the sophistication, then you can also um, randomize um, the, your header signature. Uh, so one classic thing that we see with BART is they rotate every single request, they rotate the user agent. So that's obviously because that's one thing that um, a web administrator will see on their access log. Uh, they will rotate a user agent so that you don't catch them, or at least you don't, you know, you don't start blocking them based on the user agent string. Uh, some will go as far as impersonating browsers, you know, browsers, with real browsers. Uh, they will try to impersonate the header signature. Um, you know, like they will pretend to be Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer. Then going even further in a sophistication, some will support cookies. They will have full cookie support. They, you know, you send them a cookie, they reply with a cookie user. Or every time you update the cookies, they reply. So that's, you know, even a bit more sophisticated. Some will also follow redirects if you just dump a redirect on them. 
Uh, some will partially or fully support JavaScript, so you've got frameworks like PhantomJS who can allow, allow you to create a, a bot uh, that will fully, more or less fully support JavaScript. And some as well, some bots are, are, are also pretty much work on a full-fledged full um, web browser like uh, Selenium, uh, using the Selenium framework. And, um, and obviously, you know, as you go in the, the more, the, the more sophisticated the bot is, the more difficult it's going, to be, it's going to be to detect it. But when it comes to detection, you should not ignore the easiest way to, uh, to detect them. Like user agent, looking at the user agents, there's a minor information you can, you, you can find, you can get out of uh, user agent. Just uh, detecting based on user agent, at least you'll, you'll detect all the known bots out there, the legitimate bots. And um, you know, at least you'll be able to, you know, to, to look at them. You also will detect bots that are built on known framework. Uh, you know, there's plenty of stuff in GitHub that you can download a, a ready-made uh, scraper. Those usually had a, have a very specific signature and you know, they don't always um, uh, change the user agent string. So it's, you know, that's, the user agent string is the easiest thing in the world to, to change, to spoof. But yet, not everybody does it, so it's still very valuable to actually look at the user agent string to, uh, to detect bots. But obviously, there's so much you can get out of user agent string, so then you need to go further sometimes. You need to look at the whole header signature. Uh, you know, sometimes, obviously, they will try to pretend they're Internet Explorer, but then when you look further, uh, you'll see that there's some anomalies in, the, in their header signature, like some headers are missing or some headers are out of order. And I'll show you some examples uh, of that in a minute. Uh, based on behavior, you can also learn a lot about their behavior. So obviously, I talk about um, request rate. A lot of bots will be, uh, you know, they'll be very aggressive and they'll send a lot of requests per second. Uh, so they become very obvious, and you can see them right away. And you know, it's easy to detect them. But some obviously will will try to stay under the radar. So in that case, you need to to be more, um, you know, you you need to look at. Uh, uh, the behavior on a long, longer time period, and that's when potentially uh, like a reputation engine uh, or the fraud engine can, can help. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well in a minute. Uh, challenging them with CAPTCHA as well has been uh, one of the known way to detect bots. So nobody really, it's kind of a love and hate relationship with CAPTCHA in general, because CAPTCHA you know, in general is kind of okay for like a form. If you want the user to enter information, then at, at the end, you know, challenging them with a CAPTCHA to verify they are, they are human or not, then it's okay, but you can't really do that if the user requests for a product page, um, you can't really CAPTCHA them right away. You, right away, you're going to lose their interest and they're gonna go somewhere else. Uh, so CAPTCHA is not always appropriate, and also CAPTCHA is not, you know, it's not a silver bullet either because there's plenty of bots out there who do support CAPTCHA in a way. Um, you know, they have an OCR integrated so that they can read CAPTCHA better than a human. Uh, doing JavaScript-based validation, so the idea here is to challenge the users through JavaScript and try to collect more information on the client side to kind of verify that, okay, you're saying you're Internet Explorer, but what are your capabilities? Do you have like a, a screen uh, connected to your machine? Do you have, you know, all this kind of information? So that you can learn a lot about, about that. And then um, one thing also that works is, uh, but it's a bit more tricky, is a honeypot trap. Honeypot trap. So you add some kind of, um, like let's say some hidden form fill into a form, uh, and then you try to see if the bot's going to bite into it. But again, bots have also have learned to, to kind of recognize those, uh, those traps and avoid them. So it doesn't always work, obviously. So now let's talk a bit more in detail on some of the de detection techniques. So I've talked about detecting based on the user agent string. So those are a few examples of um, user agent strings that I see out there. Um, and so you may all be aware of Googlebot, uh, Bing, uh, Yahoo, MSN, you know, calling your size, they're all very famous search engine. But do you know about Excelid? It's also a web search engine um, uh, ba ba based in France. Um, now talking about uh, SEO, so Alexa uh, is one of the running um, bots and pretty much I see it on every single website that I, that I look at. Uh, so what they do is uh, search engine optimization. They provide service for search, en search engine optimization and audience analytics. So they, they do a lot of crawling to understand the business of the website and, and this kind of thing. Um, what about online advertising? So you probably have some, you know, you, you're working with a publisher. 
to, to display your ads on different websites out there. So the way those publisher works is actually they, they, go, they go scrape different websites where they have ad space pretty much to try to understand what the website is dealing with so that when the user, somebody, you as a user visit the website, you're going to, they're going to serve you um, an, advertise, an ad that's relevant to the site you're visiting, uh, but also relevant to your previous interest. So they kind of use both type of information, just the, you know, the, the purpose of the website you're visiting as, as well as your, your known interest. Uh, Facebook uh, is another example. So Facebook is going to crawl different websites but they're not going to crawl everything. They basically, they're only going to, uh, if somebody publish on their feed uh, a URL, uh, let's say they publish um, you know, some news article, uh, what, what Facebook's gonna do, they're gonna actu actually gonna go get that, uh, crawl that URL uh, to get to the summary of it so that they can then publish some kind of summary in, in, in people's feed. So Facebook is, is something you'll see as well. And actually, potentially, that's good for you because somebody in a social media advertise uh, your content, then you want their friend to know, and then their friend to come, and so potentially that bring uh, more users. Uh, Archive.org is another one, so it's a web archiver. Uh, just so you know, you can go in some websites to kind of see what your websites. You can go like to Webback Machine, uh, webback.org or something like that, where you can check how your website used to look in 10 years ago. So to do that, basically, every day, you know, on a regular basis, they go come and crawl your website and take a snapshot and then preserve it forever. Uh, and also, sometimes they provide service like a restoration, restore service if, uh, if for some reason you, you, know, you, you lost your data. So that's the way they, that's, you know, the one, the business model. Uh, Shopstyle.com, again, is more like a specialized search engine, um, but in commerce or fashion. Uh, but it's really like a search engine. Uh, Job Rapido, so it's, uh, it's an example of you know, those websites who will actually uh, crawl all websites out there and look for their career section and try to republish whatever job they offer. So, Again, so it's it's you know so much you can get out of the user agent string, but at least you you get the idea of uh, you know you you get visibility of scrolling your website. The problem uh, though with you know looking at user agent, if you're really doing like trying to get a unique list of uh, user agent like pretend to be who advertise themselves as a bot and crawling your website, your chances are you're actually going to see a lot um, like. It's not very uncommon for me to, to do this search on, on different customer and end up with about a thousand unique uh, user agent strings. So then the problem is, how do you classify them? Because uh, at Akamai, we've done the work on actually you know, going through every single one and categorizing them and all of this, but you as a user, as an as a individual um, uh, you know, uh, admi web administrator, uh, it's gonna be a lot of work to, uh, to try to uh, to figure out, you know, who's this different company, what's their purpose, where to describe your website, and what kind of categories they fit in. So um, it's probably best in that case to work with a company who has some kind of bot dictionary, bot directory. Uh, now I wanted to show you some example of, uh, you know, bots that I see out there, and those are very simplistic ones. Um, so for example, in the, in the first one in the, color, in, in, the, in the list here, it's a very most simplistic bot that I see, and, and I do see, the, see it often. Uh, all you see here is pretty much you're gonna get uh, the URL and then you're gonna get the host header and that's it, nothing else. No user agent, no accept header, no accept encoding, all this kind of good stuff that you usually see with a normal uh, web browser. Uh, then the second one is a little bit more evolved. Uh, at least you have a user agent string, but this one doesn't even support uh, persistent connection. So every time that you send a request, it's going to call, close the connection and then reopen it. So it's a lot of work for your, for your website. Uh, the third one, again, a little bit more evolved. Um, so, you know, pretending to be Mozilla 5, but again, it's easy to recognize because no valid web browser has such a short, short string. Uh, the last one here on the list is not even using HTTP 1.1, .1, it's using HTTP 1.0, and that's an anomaly we see a lot with, um, with website as well. Uh, but at least this one on the last uh, on the list actually support uh, compression, so that seems like it's a little, tiny bit more evolved. It's trying to press on its Chrome, but again, doesn't even have the full uh, uh, the full header here. 
Now going into a bit more evolved uh, bot, you know, at least pretending to pretending for real that is some somebody. So in that in that case here on the top, uh, the header signature at the top is an example showing a, a a bot pretending to be Firefox. Now the bottom is the actual real Firefox header signature. So what are the difference here? Uh, so first, uh, you can note that. The real Firefox will uh, advertise for support for uh, persistent connection, meaning that you have the connection header with the value keep alive. Whereas the, f the, the bots who pretend to be Firefox advertise connection closed. So that's one key difference here. The second difference here, if you look at the head header of the, or the, the order of the headers, uh, in the case of the real Firefox, is the first header is host and user agent and accept, accept encoding on connection. In the case of the bot, it's going to be different. It's accept, accept language, accept encoding, host, user, agent, connection. So right there, you got a big anomaly. Uh, the browsers usually, have, you know, their header signature is uh, is predictable. It's, it's you know, they, it's core to the to the code, uh, and they won't change. So basically, just looking at the head order is sometimes a, a big giveaway. Um, uh, you know, comparing when when you're looking for for bots. Uh, here's the same similar example, but in that case it's Chrome. Uh, so again, a big difference here. Uh, so first, the header order is wrong. In the case of uh, in the case of the bot impersonator, you're missing the accept language. Uh, you what else? You're missing the accept header. So you know all these kind of anomalies. It's kind of something you can pick on to um, to detect. So how do we efficiently Detects those bots, and uh, the problem when dealing with bots. And early in my career, when I was a technical support engineer, or even when I was a super, uh, solution architect, uh, the first uh, reaction of customers I've been working with, and my first reaction initially as well, when I, you know, in my early days, I was dealing with bots, is, you know, you see a bot, you see a signature, you're going to create. A, so you're going to create. If you have a WAF, then you're going to create a WAF rule that detect exactly that signature. And then you know, you're know going to start denying, and then you're happy, the bot goes away. And then all of a sudden, you, know, you monitor your activity on that particular rule, and all of a sudden, then you know, activity disappears over time. So what happened? Did the bot actually give up and went to a different target? Or do they morph, and now they're back, they're still there, but they you know, you don't see them anymore? So that's that's a problem because there's so much uh, variation out there, so much uh, you know variation in the ecosystem of bots. You know each bot is so unique that you, if you wanted to create a, a signature for every single unique bot that you see out there, then it's going to be a lot, a lot of signature, and you're going to be wasting your time. So the better better solution that we the better approach that we uh, that we took at Akamai is to take advantage of the anomaly scoring principle. So that principle was actually introduced by Mod Security uh, by probably four years ago now uh, with a version two of Mod Security. Uh, so the idea is that you've got a lot of rules that run uh, that, that evaluate different anomalies. And then um, each anomaly, uh, each rule has a score. And then if you, when you run all these set of rules on a particular request, the idea is you expect that at least several rules will trigger. Uh, if several rules trigger, then basically that means that you're dealing with a bot. So what we created is a bunch of, we, we did the inventory of all the typical anomalies we see in bots versus browsers versus non bots, pretty much. And, um, and look and created a bunch of rules that look for these particular anomalies and gave each of those rules a weight. And then, uh, you know, and the weight depends on how important uh, the anomaly is in relation to bots. So, and then uh, the idea is we run all this set of rules and uh, we score it, uh, we score the request, and if it goes beyond a certain threshold, then that's where we say, okay, we're dealing with a bot, otherwise you're good to go. Uh, so it's kind of like a probability engine, pretty much, but at least uh, you don't have to, to have like a, a huge set of rules. All you have to take care of is all this typical anomaly um, and, and not having a huge set of rules that at the end will no, we may not, may or may not be very efficient. So it's like a puzzle, basically. You expect in your puzzle to have four pieces. If you don't have those four pieces, then you're okay. Otherwise, you're not okay. Um, so 
again, looking at uh, header signature, uh, user agents kind of good stuff, so it's, it's nice, uh, but you know, there's so much you can get out of it. And the next step is to look at the behavior. So here I'll show some example of typical behavior I see on bots. Uh, so the first one is a bot that will send requests constantly, uh, night and day, uh, scraping the site constantly. The second one is a variation of the first one, except you know you see we see it going for a while and then it disappears and then come back. Uh, the third one is interesting because it seems that this one doesn't work at night, uh, so it's kind of probably to stay under the radar because uh, you know typically traffic at night on a website is lower, so maybe they don't want to. Um, to be too visible during that lower uh, traffic period. The fourth one is similar to the third one, except this one doesn't work weekends. Uh, and the, f the, the last one in that first uh, table, it's a bit more evolved because it's trying to at least, uh, you know, various request rate. You know, let's say one hour is gonna make, uh, you know, one minute is gonna make maybe 10 requests, a second minute is gonna make, you know, two requests, you know, going up and down to try to, not be as predictable. Now, when you compare that to real human behavior, so bots don't need to sleep, they don't need to eat, they don't need to, they're not, uh, you know, they're not distracted by various things or, that we get distracted with, they don't have to answer phone calls or this kind of thing, so they can work constantly. Whereas human, you know, we need to sleep, we need to eat, and we get distracted, and then we get bored. So basically we're going to work and be active on a website for, let's say, a couple of hours, and then we're gonna do move on, do something else, and then come back, and then, you know. So basically your, your pattern's gonna be a lot more sporadic. So overall you're not gonna make as many requests uh, as you would, uh, as a real, as a bot would. So now also I talked about, so when you talk about behavior, um, to, you know, ray control kind of shifts uh, some level of uh, bot detection to, to look at those different patterns that I just showed. Uh, but, you know, obviously having, lo looking at this from a longer time period, then is you pretty much you need a reputation engine. So what you need in one side is, you know, get basically your data feed. So it could be your access log, could be the log from your WAF, could be, a, you know, other source that you are, maybe a, another reputation database you're getting from somewhere. On the other side, you've got a bunch of heuristics that they try to detect bot-like behavior, you know, also long pattern, looking at number of requests on a very long period of time, looking at, you know, number of errors that each client produces and this kind of thing. Uh, also, you need some kind of logic to match your business logic and also some kind of logic to, uh, to reduce potentially false positive. And then at the end, what you get is a list of clients that are potentially, uh, you know, malicious. So I went through a bunch of detection techniques. Obviously, there's a lot more to that. Um, you know, I, we could we could have like a talk a whole day about detection technique and, and details, and obviously we don't have time for that. So, you know, once you've identified your bots, like you know who they are, uh, and potentially you want to keep track of them a bit more a bit more closely. So, how do you deal with them? How do you identify them? Let's say you want to create. Uh, you have a WAF, you want to create a rule to, to pay attention to them. What do you do? So the first reaction of, uh, of customer I work with is like, hey, give me the list of IP address, I'm going to blacklist it. The problem with that is, you know, bots, you know, the, having servers out there, you know, spinning up new instances of bot is pretty cheap and it's pretty easy. You've got plenty of choice out there. You've got, you know, plenty of cloud providers so you can move your, your website, you know, your bot net pretty easily. So IP address blocking, identifying based on IP address doesn't work. But identifying based on user agent doesn't work either because usually you've got, you know, they, they rotate the user agent every single request. So you could make actually the inventory of every single user agent that the bot is using, but chances are they're also trying to use legitimate user agent. So you just can't do that because obviously you're going to block real user in that case. So in that case, it's better to try to use more complex um, you know, com complex identifier where you combine maybe user, user agent, uh, well, header signature and some kind of other headers that you, that you see out there. Maybe the subnet, maybe it's a bit more relevant, so this kind of thing. So make it, try to make it as, as hard as possible for them to evade or, you know, as broad as possible while making sure that you're not potentially impacting real user as well. So false positive obviously is a big deal. So um, then when I talk to customers, like, you know, I ask them, so how, how big of a bot problem do you have? And nobody really knows. You know, they are aware of bots. Or they're aware of some known bots, like the Google of the world and the Bing. Uh, but they, and they're aware of some of the bad bots that are hitting them because some, sometimes, because 
in, in that case, uh, because there's been go some problem going on. Uh, but the real ratio of bot versus non bot and the real how much bot traffic they have, nobody really knows. And so if you look at it this way, how much bot traffic go on your website is it going to depend. And it's going to depend on the num number of pages you have on your site. Because basically, the more page you have, the more um, the bots will have to make, uh, the more requests the bots will have to make to, to call your content, to get all your content. Uh, your international exposure as well. You know, if you're international, then potentially you're going to have a lot more bots, known bots out there, a lot more search engines are going to uh, try to, uh, to index your content. And also, it all depends on the, how big of a target you are. You know, what kind of service do you provide? How, what's the resale value? If I get your content, if I get your data, what's the resale value on the black market on, on such content? How much money can I get, make out of it? So it's, um, it's also a big factor uh, what, on how much part you're gonna see. How much about that activity does Akamai see? So as I said earlier, we serve on a given day between 15 and 30% of the overall internet uh, web traffic. So obviously we have a, lot, a big playground, we, you know, we, we, are, we see a lot. Uh, so just looking only at identifying bots on the user agent, you know, whether you declare yourself as a bot or whether you, uh, you know, we detect some kind of uh, framework like Java or Python framework in the user agent string. What we saw is uh, it, it represents about a bit over 9% of, of all traffic we see on any given day. So it's a lot, obviously. It's a, it's a big chunk of uh, the traffic that's going through us. But that's not counting the bots that are harder to detect, like based on header signatures, this kind of thing. Uh, as we go into more into the, the bot management business, and obviously we'll, we'll probably have more visibility on that. So what does it mean also for some of the customers we've been working with? So I'm going to show you some, uh, some case study uh, that we've done, so some, some evaluations that we've done with a few customers. The first one is an uh, online ticketing company, so they, they sell event tickets um, uh, across North America. Um, and they came to us and they say, yeah, we know we have a lot of bad, uh, bad activity going on, um, but they didn't have clear visibility. So we enabled uh, some of our detection technique on, the, on their site. And what we found is overall uh, the bot activity account for 30% of, at least what we flagged as bot activity was 30% of the overall traffic, so which is significant. Mm -hmm. And you can see that sometimes some of the spikes are, are directly linked to, to bot activity. So what you see on the graph here, the blue area is overall traffic and the, the red line is about activity. Uh, and when you look at known bot, the ratio between known bot and unknown bot, and then in that, in that particular case, that was pretty much all known bot, uh, all unknown bot, sorry. So pretty much, you know, people who are scraping their website, you don't know how they're using their data. It's none of the you know, regular Google bot or anything like that. It's all, um, it's all potentially, you don't know what they're gonna do with your data, so potentially dangerous. Um, here's a second example where it's an e-commerce site. They sell um, auto parts online and um, here they come to us and say, yeah, we've got a big bot problem, but we see a lot of bot activity. So again, we turn on our, our detection technique, and what we saw is the bot activity accounted for 43% of the, of the overall traffic. But now, if we look at the ratio between known bot or unknown bot, pretty much uh, close to 80%, well, actually close to 90% of that overall bot activity uh, was just known bot. So like the Google bot, the Bing bot, and et cetera. And actually, um, about 50% of that, 50% uh, of that bot activity was actually coming from the Bing and the Google and et cetera. So that's an example where they don't really have a bot problem because basically what you're dealing with here is just a regular bot traffic. It's just, you know, potentially uh, that, uh, you being, uh, that, cu that customer being indexed by those different bots will potentially bring them more business. So that's potentially a good thing. And uh, the ratio of uh, unknown bot is very small, so is there something they need to worry about? Yeah, maybe. I mean, they should pay attention to it, keep an eye on it, but it's not, it's not going to impact them a lot. Uh, third example is a news website, and uh, again, we did the same thing. They had a bot, you know, they saw they, they had a lot of bot going there. On their side, they didn't know exactly what kind of bot was going on, and what we saw is overall, um, we saw that 20% of the overall traffic accounted for, um, the, the bot activity accounted for about 20% of the overall traffic. And the share between known and unknown is about 
So, so basically, in that case, being a news website, you kind of expect that you can have a lot of random bots actually going to your site because they, you know, they use that for bias business uh, reason. Um, but something obviously they probably need to keep an eye on. Um, so, so that's uh, that particular customer would potentially have a bot problem. Now you've detected, you have visibility, all good. So now you you've got the ratio between known and unknown. You can kind of figure out whether you got a bot problem or not. And if you do, then what do you do about it? So that is, so it's about managing them. Uh, and so detecting the bots is half of the problem. Now managing them the right way, giving them the proper answer so that you know they don't go underground again, it's, it's very difficult. So um, how do you respond to bots to, to make sure they don't go underground, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't morph? Uh, and how do you stop uh, playing the whack a mole game, basically? So two categories again. We got the known bots and the unknown bots. For the known bots, uh, for the most part, so they identify themselves. It's, you know, they're clearly they're they playing nice. They're saying who they are. And um, so, uh, so for them, uh, it's, uh, for the most part, they do support uh, robot.txt. So if you, for some reason you don't want them to call your site, you don't want them to index your site, just tell them so. You know, use the robot.txt and tell them, stop visiting me. And they'll go away. The only thing they're going to do is request for the robot.txt. Robot they'll see that you deny them, and they go away. So that's one way to deal with them. Another way to deal with them is if you're working with a CDN, uh, then you may be, and you know, by default, you're not caching your base page, your, your page uh, on your CDN. Then maybe it's worth actually serving the content, uh, you know, uh, the content you're serving to bots worth caching it so that then you know, your origin or your web server uh, backend can, can concentrate on dealing with real users while your CDN is dealing with just serving the content for, for bot, uh, for all the bots, so potentially saving you a lot of, uh, of that. And it's, it's not a big deal if you serve stale content to, your, to, to bots as long as they can index you and they can reference your data, uh, then, you know, you can serve them stale content. So potentially, even if you're caching with your CDN, let's say for, for a small period of time, you may want to consider actually for bots, uh, caching for a much longer time, period of time. Let's say if your default caching strategy is one hour, then for bot you may consider maybe one day because it's, you don't necessarily need to have the greatest and latest. Um, as long as they, you know, they get content, they'll be fine. What about bad bots? So by all means, don't deny, never deny. I mean, the one big customer we've been working with over time uh, is one thing they told us is the worst thing we did was to start denying bots because we forced them to morph and then we went, they went on the ground and that was harder and harder for us to, uh, to detect them. So how you should, de should you deal with them? So obviously robot.txt here doesn't even apply because nobody cares. The, bot, the, the unknown bots, they don't care about robot.txt. You can do whatever they want. They actually may visit that robot.txt, but it's just for the purpose maybe to actually see what you don't want them to, to look at so that they actually go see that. Um, but instead, what you could do is, you know, similar strategy to the known bot, serve, serve them cache content. If you don't cache by default, then serve them cache content. Serve their stale content. Uh, I actually work with a customer. We, we ran through, um, you know, this scenario. Uh, they were selling tickets online, and tickets, you know, price change over time. So the strategies that they adopted, um, adopted in that case was to, uh, for bots, serve them stale content. So potentially it's price that were completely out of date and to unbalance their the, the, you know, the business model of that uh, particular bot, whoever is running that bot. Uh, add a delay into the request if you can. Like, uh, you know, potentially if you add a delay in a response, you wait, let's say, a few seconds before you respond, then potentially you kind of slowing them down in a way and they're not gonna get all their data. They could potentially going to, you're going to put potentially break the, your, their, their business model and, you know, they may move on. They may go to a different target. Uh, serve them alternate content. So we've got some customer who actually have spun up a completely different web infrastructure just for bot. Uh, that infrastructure is tied to different uh, database so that, so that not to impact the, um, the old um, legitimate users. And, um, so, and then pretty much you're in control of what you're serving then. You, you could even choose to 
uh, to sell them fake data or you know like you increase uh, price by 20 percent or something like that so again you're you're kind of still on responding to them you're giving them content but what you're giving them is garbage so that that's you're not going to be able to use it so at least that you own better in control uh, about what's going on um captcha again is a solution but again not a lot of people hate captcha so with this, that pretty much sums up what I've been working up to for the last year at Akamai, working on detecting bots and try to better define how to manage them uh, on this kind of thing. I hope that uh, it's been insightful for, for you. And if there's any questions, then I'll take some. Yeah. So the question is, how do we deal with false positives? So obviously, false positive is a big deal. Uh, and um, so the, the, the system <clears throat> that we, was, we put in place so far, we, we've tried to be as accurate as possible. Uh, so, far, so far, we are actually doing pretty good in the false positive. But the problem is when you try to be very precise on the false positive, then obviously it will impact the false negative. So basically, you're, you're more, uh, you, know, you want to make sure that when you say it's a bot, then it's, it's really a bot. But then, then that means that you potentially will have more false negatives. So that's probably an area that we need to work more. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question. How much? Uh, it's hard to say at, the point, at this point because um, you know we kind of just start, uh, us as a company we're just starting in the bot detection uh, business. So right now we only have the visibility that are presented today about um, basically all the ones that are obvious that we can look at the user agent strings and we can tell you it's about 10%. Uh, but for the rest we don't really know and. Uh, it, again, it, it really varies. I mean, if we look at, at it at globally at the internet level, then um, then, then it maybe it's like around, maybe around 30 percent, 40 percent. But on a per customer basis, it can vary. Uh, you know, we've seen customer where it's more, uh, customer is less. So we'll probably have more detail on that. Um, you know, as we uh, as we evolve in that business. Yes. Yeah. Excessive anomaly Yeah. Yeah, so that's basically, you know, that, uh, that mechanism that we have to, uh, to detect based on the anomaly scoring. So we, we have this, uh, all this set of rules that look for different anomalies, and then we score, we score the, the request uh, each time. And basically, that, that, that method as the one that's been the most successful in that case to detect all that uh, malicious, well, that bot activity. Okay. And then you asked about false positives. Do you have any rough idea what your false positive rate is with your nominal scoring? So actually, so initially when we started, uh, so we tried to evolve the system more and more to just to be as precise as we can. When we first started our first release, we actually had a fair amount of false positive. Since we had about four releases, and now actually we are pretty accurate, uh, I, you know, I keep looking at it, and uh, on pretty much now it's becoming difficult to actually find false positives. So, and one of our customers we're working with actually rated us at about 99.95 percent. So we're doing pretty good, but you know we'll, we keep uh, we need to make sure we keep uh, accurate on that. Uh, one question at the back over there. So it's pretty much, uh, so the question is, uh, w w what's a header signature based off, mostly? So the header signature anomalies that we have is, is pretty much based on header signature. We, we cannot evaluate every single request a header signature, and then we determine whether it's good or bad. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's how it works right now. Right, no, it's not on a traffic pattern. So basically, the, the, the products that we are, we're building 
is, you know, you can't, there's so much you can get out of a single detection technique. The idea is you need to have multiple detection techniques working together to make sure that you, you have as big of a reach or as big of a, a, a net as possible to catch uh, bots. Because as I said earlier, they, none of them are equal. They all have different characteristics. And so some of them you'll be able to detect them based on, on behavior, like uh, you know, they have a high request rate. On, over time, you see that they have very bad reputation. So that's really behavior based. Uh, the, the header signature uh, anomaly is really purely on you know, what you see when you get the request. If you see that you, you know, some, some headers are not there, you expect certain headers are not there, then basically it's, it's pretty much yeah, it's based on that, so based on those particular characteristics. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question is how much latency do, does uh, bot detection add? So obviously working for uh, a company that our primary business is uh, web acceleration, obviously for us it's a big deal to, to make sure that whatever security detection we add uh, doesn't impact the, 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 the performance. Uh, so far what we've seen, uh, it takes about one to two milliseconds to, to run uh, all these detection techniques. So pretty much your, your latency is, is very, very small. Uh, but we, we as a company close, keep a, close, a very close eye into, into this to make sure that we don't impact performance in any kind of way. Uh, time for one more question. Okay, so I'll take this question. You? Go ahead. So, um, so the question is how how much sophisticated how much uh, what sophistic how much does sophisticated bot account for the overall bot activity? Um, I don't really have a good answer for that because you know we're again we're just starting on, on this kind of thing, and also so far what we've uh, released so far is actually you know more focusing on the well trying to get as complex as we can. Uh, but to be honest, we actually need to work a lot more on, the, on trying to detect the more complex one. And how to detect the more complex one is pretty much you have to go into uh, you know, JavaScript-based evaluation. So when you, you do like uh, JavaScript-based fingerprinting, and then you, you try to, um, to extract different kind of characteristics from the client itself, then you process that information, and then that's where you, you can you know, detect the more sophisticated bot. But how much do they account? you know, uh, into the overall bot activity. I think today, uh, to be honest, I think a lot of bots that we see out there, they're still pretty on the dumb side. Uh, but this will evolve, obviously, as you, you know, there's more and more companies out there who do bot detection. So obviously, uh, you know, it's an arms race. Um, every time it's trying to get better, we try to get better on the detection, and they're trying to get better to bypass our detection. Uh, so over time, this will evolve. Today, we still see a fair amount of dumb bot. But over time, well, it's likely that we'll see more sophisticated bot, and we have to keep track of that, to keep up with that. 